I've been up here a few times before, but it's always a long time in between, so I never get used to it. But uh, this is the first time I've been when Mr. Grant from what's sitting right back there give me encouragement. Um, I miss Mr. Grantham, but I think he's right here with me, and he's going to give me help help get me through this tonight. But uh, love Mr. Grantham. Let me tell you a couple of stories that I've had. I heard of a visiting preacher coming to a church one day, and he started preaching, and he preached and preached and preached and preached, and then he preached some more, and finally, the old man got up and started walking out, and. Uh, the preacher says, stop, says, where are you going? He says, I'm going home to mow grass. He says, why didn't you mow grass before you came? He says, it didn't need one before I came. <laughs> so, so I promise you we'll get out tonight before your grass needs more. <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you about a couple of fellas that I work with. They've been working with me a couple of years. Uh, one's name's... Gallardo Landaverde, we call him Gil. The other one is Jesus Gallardo. And uh, Gallardo call, or Gil calls me Brother Abraham all the time. He come in one morning and said, Brother Abraham, I said, you remind me of Abraham in the Bible. And that kind of, I said, well, I want to hear how this is, but when I pinpointed him on it, he couldn't come up with nothing, so I guess we were just both real old. I think that's what he was talking about. And, and Jesus, I got Jesus' phone on speed dial, or his number on speed dial in my phone, so I, I was on the counter one day, and he was in there and some more people, and I said, look, I got Jesus on speed dial right here. And Jesus looked up, and he said, it's better to have him in your heart than in your telephone. So, so, so we need to, Care more about having Jesus in our heart than what we have in our telephones. We care too much about those telephones sometimes. Uh, I told Brother Danny that I was reviewing some stuff that I've, I've already used before. And I know Sunday he said he was re, re doing, that he was saying something for, you know, doing something for a second time too. And he said that, that that's okay. So uh, if you've heard it before, it might not be for you. It might be for somebody else. But uh, it's all, all of Easter based is what I'm, what I'm speaking of. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. It had been a long day in Jerusalem. It, it had been a long day. Jerusalem is packed with Passover guests most of whom clamor for a glimpse of the teacher. The spring sun is warm, the streets are dry, and the disciples are a long way from home. A splash of cool water would be refreshing. The disciples enter one by one and take their places around their table. On the wall hangs a towel, and on the floor sits a pitcher and a basin. Any one of the disciples could volunteer for the job, but no one does. After a few moments, Jesus stands, removes his outer garment. Then he wraps a servant's girdle around his waist, takes up the basin, and kneels before one of his disciples. He unlaces a sandal and gently lifts the foot and places it in the basin, covers it with water, and begins to bathe it. One by one, one grimy foot after another, Jesus works his way down the road. In Jesus' day, the wash, washing of feet was a task reserved not for servants, but for the lowest of servants. Every circle has its pecking order, and the circle of household workers was no exception. The servant at the bottom of the totem pole was expected to be the one on his knees with the towel in the basin. In this case, the one with the towel in the basin is the king of the universe. Hands that shape the stars are now washing away filth. Fingers that form mountains now massage toes. And the one before whom all nations will one day kneel now kneels before his disciples. Hours before his own death, Jesus' concern is singular. He wants his disciples to know how much he loves them. More than removing dirt, Jesus is removing doubt. 
Jesus knows what will happen to his hands at the crucifixion. Within 24 hours, they will be pierced and lifeless. Of all the times we'd expect him to ask the disciples' attention, this would be one, but he doesn't. You can be sure Jesus knows the future of these feet he is washing. 24 feet will not spend the next day following their master, defending his cause. These feet will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. Only one pair won't abandon him in the garden. One disciple won't desert him at Gethsemane. Judas won't even make it that far. He will abandon Jesus that very night at the table. And if you look in the Bible, you don't see where it says... Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except Judas. He washed his feet too. So when he looked down at his feet, he knew what Jesus had done for him. Within hours, the feet of Judas, cleansed with the kindness of the one he will portray, was standing in Caiaphas' court. Behold the gift Jesus gives his followers. He knows what these men are about to do. He knows they are about to perform the vilest act of their lives. By morning, they will bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them and he washed their feet. He wants them to realize those feet are still clean. You don't understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later, he says in John 13 to 7. He begave their sin before they even committed it, and he offered mercy before they even solved it. Aside from the time and the geography, our story is the same as the disciples. We weren't in Jerusalem, and we weren't alive that night. But what Jesus did for them, he has done for us. He has cleansed us. He has cleansed our hearts from sin. Even more, he is still cleansing us. John tells us we are being cleansed from every sin by the blood of Jesus. In other words, we are always being cleansed. The cleansing is not a promise for the future, but a reality in the present. Let a speck of dust fall on the soul of a saint, and it is washed away. Let a spot of filth land on the heart of God's child, and the filth is wiped away. Jesus still cleans the feet of, cleans his disciples' feet. Jesus still washes away stains. Jesus still purifies his people. Our Savior kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives, but rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out in kindness and says, I can clean that if you want. And from the basin of his grace, he scoops up a palm full of mercy and he washes away our sins. Of all the men in the room, that night only one was worthy to have his feet washed and he was one who washed the feet the one worthy of being served served others the genius of Jesus example is that the burden of bridge building falls on the strong one not on the weak one the one who is innocent is the one who makes the gesture so when we have times in our life when somebody does us wrong Sometimes it's up to us to build a bridge instead of waiting on them to do it. It might not happen. This is something I hadn't decided on until I got here. Um, me and Darlene were riding home from church Easter, Easter Sunday. A lady that she works with sent her a song, um, and it was all about Easter, about Jesus on the cross. It says, I'll rise again. And, Dave, do you have any music ready? Do you find the music? There's a reason for that. There's none up there. Uh, but um, two reasons. No. Video recordings. Have you ever been down the road singing on to the radio and the radio starts singing one thing and you'll be singing another? You can't, you can't rely on recorded music. Uh, but... 
And another thing, if I was going to try to sing this song and the music was going, you wouldn't be able to hear it. <laughs> so I'm going to try this song, just, but don't pay attention to any singing. Just pay attention to the words. Keep praying for me. I just need to know how far I need to stand from this mic. I don't want to. Am I standing about right? Okay. Go ahead. Drive the nails in my hands. Laugh at me where you stand. Go ahead and say it isn't me. The day will come when you will see cause I'll rise again. There ain't no power on earth can tie me down. Yes, I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in the ground. Go ahead and mock my name. My love for you is still the same. Go ahead and bury me. But very soon I will be free cause I'll rise again there ain't no power on earth can tie me down yes I'll rise again death can't keep me in the ground go ahead and say I'm dead and gone but you will see that you were wrong go ahead and try and hide the sun but all will see that I'm the one cause I'll come again. Ain't no power on earth can keep me back. Yes, I'll come again. Come to take my people back. When I heard that, she sent to Darlene's telephone. We listened to it on the way home. It told about driving the nails in his hand. And every time we see him, we're hitting that nail a little harder. And he's not singing to just those that were there that witnessed it that day. He's singing to all of us. In after the crucifixion, get to and the two women go to anoint the body of Jesus. When they leave, they're stopped in their let me see. They're told to go and find the disciples and Peter and to, for him to go ahead into Galilee and Jesus will join them there. And Mark's the only book that, t that tells you and Peter. And to me, I like that because I can put my name in there when we know we failed, he still loves us. He, uh, if we come to him, he won't back up from us. He'll be there for us. I'm going to read something that I read to you before. Some of you have heard it before. Some of you haven't. It's called a donut story, but it's nothing about a donut. So there was a certain professor of religion named Dr. Christensen who taught at a small college in the western United States. Dr. Christensen taught the required survey course in Christianity at his particular institution. Every student was required to take this course his freshman year, regardless of his or her major. Although Dr. Christensen tried hard to communicate the essence of the gospel in his class, he found that most of his students looked upon the 
course is nothing but required drudgery. Despite his best efforts, most students refused to take Christianity seriously. This year, Dr. Christensen had a special student named Steve. Steve was only a freshman, but he was studying with the antenna going into seminary for the ministry. Steve was a popular guy, he was well-liked, and he was a pretty good physical, physical specimen. He was a good athlete, he played on the football team, and he was the best student in the professor's class. One day, Dr. Christensen asked Steve to stay after class so he could talk with him. How many push-ups can you do, Steve? Steve said, I do about 200 every night. 200, that's pretty good, Steve, Dr. Christensen said. Do you think you could do 300? Steve said, I don't know. I've never tried to do 300 at a time. Do you think you could? Well, I can try, said Steve. Can you do 300 in sets of 10? I have a class project in mind, and I need you to do about 300 push-ups in sets of 10 for this to work. Can you do it? I need you to tell me you can do it, said the professor. Steve said, well, I think I, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. Dr. Christensen said, good. I need you to do this on Friday. Let me explain what I have in mind. Friday came and Steve got into class early and sat at the front of the room. When he started, the professor pulled out a big box of donuts. These were not the normal kind of donuts. These were the big donuts with the frosting and the chocolate and swirls on them. Everyone was pretty excited. It was Friday, the last day of the, last class day of the year, and they were going to get an early start on the weekend with a party. Dr. Christensen went to the first girl on the first row and asked Cynthia, do you want to have one of these donuts? Cynthia said, yes. Then Dr. Christensen turned to Steve and asked, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Cynthia can have a donut? Sure, Steve jumped down from his desk to do a quick 10. Then Steve again sat in his desk. Dr. Christensen put a donut on Cynthia's desk. Dr. Christensen went to Joe, the next person, and asked, Joe, do you want a donut? Sure, said Joe. Dr. Christensen said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Joe can have a donut? Steve did 10 push-ups, Joe got a donut, and so it went down the first aisle. Steve did 10 push-ups for every person before they got their donut. Walking down the second aisle, Dr. Chris Christensen came to Scott. Scott was on the basket team, and he was also a good athlete. He was a popular guy, and when the professor asked him, Scott, do you want a donut? Scott's reply was, well, I can do my own push-ups. Dr. Christensen said, no, Steve has to do them. Then Scott said, well, I don't want one then. Dr. Christensen shrugged and turned to Steve and asked, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so Scott can have a donut he doesn't want? <laughs> With perfect obedience, Steve started to do 10 push-ups. Scott said, hey, I said I didn't want one. Dr. Christensen said, look, this is my classroom, my class, my desk, and these are my donuts. Just leave it on the desk if you don't want it. And he put the donut on Scott's desk. Now by the time Steve had been, now by this time Steve had begun to slow down a little. He just stayed on the floor in between sets because it took too much effort to get up and down. Could you see a little? You could see a little perspiration around his brow. Dr. Christensen started down the third row. Now students were beginning to get a little angry. Dr. Christensen said, "Jenny, do you want a donut?" Sternly, Jenny said, "No." Then Dr. Christensen said. Steve, would you do 10 more push-ups so Jenny can have a donut she doesn't want? Steve did 10, Jenny got a donut. By now, a growing sense of uneasiness filled the room. The students were beginning to say no, and there were all these uneaten donuts on the desk. Steve also had to really put forth a lot of extra effort to get these push-ups done for each donut. There began to be a small pool of sweat on the floor beneath his face. His arms and brow were beginning to get red because of the physical effort involved. Dr. Christensen asked Robert, who is the most vocal unbeliever in the class, to watch Steve do each push-up to make sure he did the full 10 push-ups in a set because he couldn't bear to watch Steve, because he couldn't bear to watch all of Steve's work for all of the, those uneaten donuts. He sent Robert over 
to where Steve was so Robert could count the set and watch Steve closely. Dr. Christensen started down the fourth row. During his class, however, some students from other classes had wandered in and sat down on the steps alongside the radiators that ran down the sides of the room. When the professor realized this, he did a quick count and saw that now there was 34 students in the room. He started to worry if Steve, if Steve would be able to make it. Dr. Christensen went on to the next person and the next and the next. Near the end of that row, Steve was really having a rough time. He was taking a lot more time to complete each set. Steve asked Dr. Christensen, do I have to touch my nose on each one? Dr. Christensen thought for a moment, well, do your push-ups, you're in charge. You can do them any way you want. And Dr. Christensen went on. A few moments later, Jason, a recent transfer student, came to the room and was about to come in when all the students yelled in one voice, no, don't come in, stay out. Jason didn't know what was going on. Steve picked up and his head and said, no, let him come in, Professor Christensen. No, let him come in, Pro Pro Professor Christensen. <laughs> you realize, Pro Professor Christensen said, you realize that if Jason comes in, you'll have to do 10 push-ups for him. Then Steve said, yes, let him come in, give him a donut. Dr. Christensen said, okay, Steve, I'll get your, I'll let you get Jason's out of the way right now. Jason, do you want a donut? Jason, new to the room, hardly knew what was going on. Yes, he said, give me a donut. Then, Steve, will you do 10 push-ups so Jason can have a donut? Jason, Steve did 10 push-ups very slowly and with great effort. Jason, bewildered, was handed a donut and sat down. Dr. Christensen finished the fourth row and then started on those visitors seated by the heaters. Steve's arms were now shaking with each push-up and a struggle to lift himself against the force of gravity. By this time, sweat was profusely dropping off his face. There was no sound except his heavy breathing. There was not one dry eye in the room. The very last two students in the room were two young women, both cheerleaders and very popular. Dr. Christensen went to Linda, the second to last, and asked, Linda, do you want a donut? Linda said very sadly, no, thank you. Professor Christensen quietly asked, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Linda can have a donut she doesn't want? Grunting from the effort, Steve did 10 very slow push-ups for Linda. Then Dr. Christensen turned to the last girl, Susan. Susan, do you want a donut? Susan, with tears flowing down her face, began to cry. Dr. Christensen, why can't I help him? Dr. Christensen, with tears of his own, said, no, Steve has to do it alone. I have given him this task, and he is in charge of seeing that everyone has a opportunity for a donut whether they won't want it or not. When I decided to have a party on the last day of class, I looked at my grade book. Steve here is the only student with a perfect grade. Everyone else had failed a test, skipped class, or offered me inferior work. Steve told me that in football practice, when a player messes up, he must do push-ups. <laughs> I told Steve that none of you could come to my party unless he paid the price by doing your push-ups. He and I made a deal for your sakes. Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so St Susan can have a donut? As Steve very slowly finished his last push-up with the understanding that he had accomplished all that was acquired of him, having done 350 push-ups, his arms buckled beneath him and he fell to the floor. Dr. Christensen turned to the room and said, and so it was that our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross fled to the Father. Into thy hands I commend my spirit with the understanding that he had done everything that was required of him, he yielded up his life. And like some of those in this room, many of us leave the gift on the desk uneaten. Two students helped Steve off the floor into a seat, physically exhausted but wearing a thin smile. Well done, my good and faithful servant, the professor said the professor, adding, not all sermons are teached in words. Turning to his class, the professor said, my wish is that you might understand and fully comprehend all the riches and grace and mercy have been given to you through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He spared not, not, he spared not his only begotten Son, but gave him up for us all, for the whole church, now and forever. Whether or not we choose to accept this gift, gift is up to us. The price has been paid. And 
what Danny was saying Sunday, he was saying the price has already been paid, but we still have to accept it. The, uh, and Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever for, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you haven't given your heart to Jesus, I pray that you just Say a prayer to offer, to welcome him into your heart because he's ready to come in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for this day. I just pray that you be with each one as they leave here. I pray that your word has touched someone tonight, Lord. Pray that you lead them home safely, Lord, and just keep the word in their heart. We pray all this in your name. Amen.